We celebrated the fifth anniversary of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act on March 23rd. I must say that today I am more optimistic than ever about the demise of Obamacare. First of all, the elections in 2012, the King v. Burwell case, which you heard about, and I'll add a few things to that, um, and the new, the new uh, Republican uh, Congress. You know, um, that great American prognosticator, Nancy Pelosi, um, she lives, I live, I work in San Francisco, but fortunately I don't have to vote in San Francisco. But she said with certainty in March of 2014 that Obamacare would be a winning issue for the Democrats in the midterm elections. Of course, it wasn't. Now, just the other day she said that in the re King v. Burwell, the GOP will rue the day the court invalidates the subsidies. So we shall see. And her best statement of all was the one 11 days before the bill was signed into law. We have to pass this bill so that we can find out what's in it. Senator Chuck Schumer identified a key reason that the Democrats did so badly in the 2014 elections. He said, the party focused on the wrong problem, health care reform. But the polls have been right all along. Still today, 54% of Americans would like to see Obamacare repealed and replaced. The American people realize, and particularly in the States, that there are serious problems with this law. The website glitches, the 800,000 people who got incorrect tax statements, the 5 million who lost their policies that were canceled, higher premiums and deductibles, and the big issue in my mind is low, uh, smaller networks of doctors and hospitals. What I like to say is understanding healthcare is similar to unraveling an onion. I don't know how many men here work in the kitchen and unravel onions, but it is a very tearful moment. <laughs> I think all Americans, we all agree, we want affordable, accessible, quality care. The question is, how do we achieve that goal? And there are two visions. One which focuses on patient-centered solutions, empowering doctors and patients. The other relies on increasing the role of government in our healthcare system through increased taxes, mandates, subsidies, and controls on insurance companies. This was President Obama's vision and what he has achieved with the ACA, the first president in 100 years to be able to make major changes to our healthcare system. In my mind, his ultimate goal is Medicare for all. So, we really, we have a major job because when people are in charge of their own health care, they will make informed choices about the type of health care that suits their needs and those of their family. And Milton and Rose Friedman, my great mentors, they wrote that wonderful book, Free to Choose. I say, let the American people be free to choose. We in America spend about 18% of our gross domestic product on health care, $3 trillion a year. No question we spend more than any other country in the world, but we are a prosperous country and people do demand the best in health care. You just hear people talking about, I couldn't get an appointment with my dermatologist, I couldn't get an appointment with so-and-so. They get very upset by that. We expect the best in health care. Now, as David mentioned, I am from Canada. I grew up there, I left in 1991. Canada spends 11.4% of GDP on health care. You hear always in the media, well, if Canada can spend 11.4%, why don't we in America spend 11.4%? By the way, the Congressional Budget Office has said, while we spend 18% today in America, we will be spending 20% of our GDP um, in 2025. So we're going to be spending more, not less. But in a country like Canada, where private health care is outlawed under the Canada Health Act, what happens? People demand more health care than the government is willing to supply. You get long waiting lists for care, ration care, and lack of access to the latest technology. The average wait in Canada today from seeing a primary care doc to getting treatment by a specialist is 18.2 weeks. Is that what we want in America? That is my real concern that this country will go, be, is on a road to a single payer health care system. My own mother died of colon cancer in Canada when she thought she had colon cancer and her GP said, well, I don't think so, but we'll get an X-ray. I said, mom, you don't discover colon cancer with an X-ray. Call back and ask for a colonoscopy. 
she said, well, why don't you do it? And I said, no, you do it. And she did, and she was told, you're a senior, and therefore, we have too many people below 65 waiting for a colonoscopy and who have serious problems. Finally, in November, six months later, my mom was hemorrhaging. She went to Vancouver General Hospital, one of Canada's largest hospitals. She spent two days in the emergency room, two days in the transit lounge, waiting for a bed in a ward. She got her colonoscopy eventually and died two weeks later from metastasized colon cancer. When government is calling the shots, the patient is not in power. And I'm just so worried about this, about this law. Most doctors today have a pessimistic view of Obamacare. According to a new study from Deloitte, 60% of doctors plan to retire in the next one to three years. And three quarters of physicians and 81% of specialists believe that the brightest young people will not go into medicine anymore. And the Association of American Colleges has said, by 2025, there will be a shortage of 91,000 docs. Half will be primary care and half will be general surgeons. The president keeps saying we need more people in primary care, but if fewer people are going into primary care and doctors are retiring, this is going to lead to another rationing situation. The president had two main goals with his health care law. One was to um, achieve universal coverage. The second was to bring the cost curve down. He never achieved and has not achieved in either. On the issue of the uninsured, the Congressional Budget Office has said by 2023, still 23 million Americans will be without insurance. This is not universal coverage. On the issue of bending the cost curve down, the president wanted a health care law that cost $900 billion over 10 years. The law was costed out $940 billion over 10 years. What's, you know, that's just a small amount when it comes to government. But the cost already for the decade 2015 to 2024 is up to $1.79 trillion. That's almost double what they estimated. And I believe that this law, unless repealed and replaced, will cost $2.6 trillion over the decade 2016 to 2024. So this is not bending the cost curve down at all. And if you remember, well, none of us were alive in 1965. We're far too young. Uh, but when Medicare and Medicaid came into being, the, uh, Lyndon Johnson and his great society, Medicare was estimated to cost $3 billion in the first year, and it came in around that level. And at that time, the average American lived to age 65. Today, they live to 79. But they predicted by 1990 that Medicare would cost $12 billion. Well, who knows what Medicare cost in 1990? $110 billion. So you can see why I have no confidence in the government statistics on what, on what the Affordable Care Act is going to, to cost and do to our health care. There are, I have about 18 pillars of the Obamacare, but I know you don't want to be here for the next two days, so, and Peter Farrell is going to speak at lunch, and I don't want to steal from his time. But, you know, one, a couple of important things, the individual mandate, um, that mandated that everybody have insurance or pay a fine. It was upheld uh, by the Supreme Court under Congress's power to tax. Last year, the um, individual mandate, if you didn't have it coverage, was $95 or 1% of income. This year, it's 2% of income or $325. Uh, the average penalty paid last year, $1,140. So H&R Block came out with their numbers saying that filers who received those Affordable Care Act subsidies, about two-thirds of them, had to repay the government $723. So, um, that was a surprise for a lot of people, and particularly those people who had already filed. The exchanges are a key part of Obamacare, and we heard about that in the uh, um, earlier session. But there are two types, one for individuals and families, and the other for people in small business. The open enrollment was extended, and, uh, open enrollment didn't start until after the November election. To me, that seemed odd that it was supposed to start in October, but they moved the date till after the election. But 13 states and D.C. have built their own exchanges, and 37 are operated by healthcare.gov. It's interesting, I think, that nearly half of the states that run their exchanges are already suffering from financial instability. And so many of you are probably 
um, you know, in those states. Oregon, Maryland, Hawaii just decided they, last week that they can't run their state exchange anymore. California is in deep doo-doo. Uh, Peter Lee, the executive director of Covered California, said they're 300,000 short on the enrollees that they expected to have. And he said the whole survival of the Covered California is in jeopardy at this particular moment. They have 1.4 million enrollees this year, 1.4 million last year, but 300,000 did not re-up re for, their, for their coverage. We have 11.7 million Americans signed up, 8.8 .8 million who are on uh, the uh, 37 states under healthcare.gov, and two, only 2.9 million on the state exchanges. And as we heard, 89% of the people who are, on, who are getting coverage through the exchange are getting subsidies. But it's interesting, only 80 to 85% of the people who signed up are actually going to pay the first month's premium. And we saw that last year. That's why the numbers were brought way down. So um, there's a lot going on. So if the court rules in favor of King, the plaintiff in King v. Burwell, um, and the, you know, the, the pressure is on for states to build their own exchanges, how can they when all the ones we have are very expensive and they're failing? So, it's really going to be, it's an interesting dilemma uh, for the states. Um, as, as we heard, the, the Pacific Research Institute, I, I was invited to give a, write an amicus brief um, in the case, and of course, the left-wing media came way out saying I'm one of the worst people in the world fighting um, for King, but I think, but it, it's, it's, a, it's really the hub of Obamacare. Um, the, we're expecting the decision at the, at the end of June. And as I say, I am optimistic that the court will rule the right way. I think John Roberts, um, well, it was a huge surprise to me that he um, went with the individual mandate um, being um, legal under Congress's power to tax. But about a week before that vote in June 2012 came down, one of my friends who had worked with him at the, in the Reagan uh, White House in the legal department had said, don't be so sure how Mr. Roberts will vote because he tends to be a non-high-risk person. So sure enough, I had to change four op-eds that I'd already written and, and, and it was very um, distressing to me. But um, anyway, the law is there, but I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about the decision. Now, the big issue right now is how, if King v. Burwell, if, um, if, if King wins and the subsidies are ruled illegal, the employer mandate will fall, the individual mandate will fall. But what do we do with the 7.7 .7 million people? And out of a population of 350 million, it's not, it's not that many people. But what, what, what do we do with those people who lose their, their coverage? Now, most of the s solutions that are out there right now, whether it's um, Senator Barrasso, Senator Ben Sass, whether it's Hatch, uh, Upton, and um, um, King, or whether it's Bur whatever, all these plans that are out there, they all now have a bridge. We need a bridge, we need a transition. Senator Ron Johnson has the longest bridge. He's saying we need to bridge um, this till um, August 2017. And I'm wondering if he's saying that because he has a very tough election ahead of him and he wants to be seen as you know, being a nice guy. I'm not so keen on these bridge transition things. I, I like the, um, the, the plan that came out uh, last week from Dr. Tom Price, chairman of the Budget Committee. His plan is um, a really great plan. It doesn't provide a bridge, but it does provide for um, refundable tax credits, um, age-based, not income-based, that would go into effect as soon as the court makes a decision on how long the, um, the, um, the federal subsidies will be legal. So I'm going to talk a bit about Tom Price's plan, which I'm I'm quite, I'm quite excited about, but we shall, we shall see. The, que the issue is that the older and sicker people are signing up for coverage on the exchanges. We, the, the government predicted that 40% of the people who signed up on the exchanges were going to have to be people um, in the young invincible age group. I passed out of that age group a little while ago, but it's the people 18 to 34. Only 28% of the young invincibles are signed up for um, coverage under the exchanges, which means that the young people are paying a lot more for coverage in order to subsidize those people who are older and sicker. You know, let's face it, young people, why, 
you know, they're invincibles. They want to take girls out on a date, take boys out on a date. They want to, you know, make car payments. They don't want to be spending $260 to $300 a month on health care when they don't believe that they are ever going to get sick. So that has been, that's been a problem for the administration and the whole cost. Many insurers are limiting the choices of networks and of doctors and hospitals that people in the exchanges have. Nationwide, 70% of the Obamacare plans offer fewer doctor and hospital networks than pre-Obamacare. So, you know, I think this has been something that is really, the, the American public are up in arms about, because you, you, you buy coverage on the exchange, whether you buy the silver plan, the bronze plan, platinum, and then you think, well, I've got coverage, and I gave up my previous coverage. You go to call your doctor's office, and your doctor is not part of that plan. That is very upsetting. For me, losing my doctor is almost as important as losing my hairdresser. I mean, it's very, very, people are very tied to, to their doctors and hospitals. In California, I mean, Michelle probably knows this, I mean, Anthem Blue Cross was the only provider in California that had UCLA, UCLA medical system in their network. Cedars-Sinai never, never accepted any of the exchange plans. These are hospitals that a lot of people look up to and, and want to use. Healthcare.gov has been very, very expensive. The cost to date, $2.2 billion. And it was supposed to have cost around $600 million. I don't know if you saw, but QSSI that has been managing the website was just terminated uh, last week. We don't know why. Is it because Andy Slavitt might be made the permanent administrator of, of um, CMS? I don't know. There's a lot of shenanigans going on there. But he left uh, United um, Optum to join the administration. So who knows? But um, there's a lot of stuff to look at. Um, earlier, it was said about Medicaid. And you asked the question about Medicaid in the states. I don't believe states are going to expand their Medicaid. Um, they originally, under Obamacare, states were mandated to expand, but in a vote of 7 to 2, the court turned that down. The majority of the coverage under the ACA is Medicaid coverage. 11.7 million new enrollees in Medicaid across the country, bringing the total people on Medicaid to 70 million Americans. So it's, it's a huge program. But how is the program working? 21 states are not participating in the expansion, and 29 in D.C. are. 89% of the increase in coverage in 2050 this year is due to Medicaid. Now, what about Medicaid? We saw this with Romney Care in Massachusetts. You know, when, when uh, the, the, uh, connect, the Massachusetts connector came into being, th um, they thought that this was going to reduce the cost curve, many more people would get covered. But as people signed up in Massachusetts on Medicaid, what happened? They couldn't find a doctor. So emergency room use went up in Massachusetts under Romney Care. And the whole idea of the president and Zeke Emanuel, their whole idea of Obamacare was to reduce expensive, costly use of ERs. Well, in a new survey from the American College of Emergency Physicians, emergency room use has increased 75% over the past year. And why is that? Doctors are only paid between 35 to 42 percent of what they, get treat, what they get from treating a private patient versus Medicaid. So is it any wonder that doctors are treating fewer Medicaid patients? So this is a huge problem. So I, I just don't see the incentive for states to increase their Medicaid funding. Plus, the Medicaid funding from the feds, that increase, was only going to last for three years. So, um, that's another problem. The employer mandate was delayed till January 1st, 2015. And for those from 50 to 99 people, it was delayed till next year. But if the Supreme Court rules, as I think it might, the employer mandate is going to collapse. 160 million Americans get their health care through their employer. I think it's wrong. We should all have, we don't get our house insurance, our car insurance from our employer. But this was a gift from the federal government to employers during World War II when wage and price controls were in. This was a way for employers to be able to expand and attract uh, new, people, new people. And of course, the president said that um, you know, he's been very critical of those firms that have reduced their part-time labor forces. Do you remember Staples announced that workers 
would have to keep their hours at 25 or less, because under Obamacare, 30 hours is considered a full-time work week. President Obama said he didn't like the announcement and said such corporations as Staples can well afford to pay more. I have not looked at Staples stock lately but, or the CEO's compensation, but I suspect they could well afford to treat their workers favorably and give them some basic financial security. Well, of course, if you get your coverage through your employer, you're actually getting reduced wages because your employer is paying for your health health coverage. But UPS, Target, they've all, because of Obamacare, reduced their part-time uh, labor force. So following the 2014 elections and Republicans taking control of the House and Senate, the Republicans need to find a way to have an upcoming replacement plan that includes uh, free market options that the public can support. Under Obamacare, as you know, Insurance companies can't discriminate based on your age, pre-existing conditions. Children can stay on their parents' plans till age 26, and there are no lifetime limits. So people like these ideas. So we have to think of a way to transition to deal with those issues while putting the market back in charge. Many economists, and myself included, really believe that if the Affordable Care Act is not repealed and replaced, we will be on the path to a public insurance option. That is what Nancy Pelosi wanted. Remember, the House had a public option, but it didn't make it in the Senate bill. But demand for health care will be higher. Insurance companies will not be able to afford to pay. And we're going to be crowding out insurers and leaving us with one insurer, the federal government. And Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid made this clear when he was asked, should the United States abandon insurance as, as a means of accessing health care? He replied, yes. Yes, absolutely yes. We have seen 24 delays in implementation of the law by the administration. All of these delays should have gone through Congress, but they didn't. The, the president said, um, I am free to do what I want. And we have certainly seen that um, under his administration. So what's ahead for us? Um, as I said, the Supreme Court decision, the elections, um, we want to repeal and replace. There cannot be full repeal and replacement in my mind um, until uh, the 2017 new, new Congress comes into being and one hopes that we'll have a Republican president and control of, of the House and Senate. But um, the, the bill, um, the Affordable Care Act has been repealed by the House four times. Certain parts have been repealed 56 times. In 1989, Dan Rostenkowski was run out of Washington over the Medicare catastrophic uh, plan, and that was repealed. So just be, when people say we can't repeal something, it can be done, but it's going to take a lot of um, resolve on the part of the new administration. If the court, um, when the court rules, um, and, stri and they stri if they strike down the subsidies, um, Republicans need to be ready with their new plan. And I think they have said that reconciliation um, with the legislative process where Congress may seek to implement savings, fiscal savings, by reconciling the tax and entitlement statutes with a budget res resolution, I think this is a distinct possibility. Um, and so the House and the Senate on the budget that they passed have agreed with that. And a reconciliation deal cannot be filibustered in the Senate. They only need 51 votes, and debate is limited to 20 hours. So if President Obama repeals or vetoes a reconciliation bill, I mean, yes, a reconciliation bill, which I believe he will, I think it will be clear to the American voters who don't like the Affordable Care Act that this, this is their reason to get behind the Republican Party and candidates in the 2016 election.